各位朋友，你好，我是史东。呃，再次的说一声非常谢谢你按时的收看《八方论坛》这个节目。呃，有一个小故事先跟你讲一下，大概在现在想起来，大概快一个月以前了吧。我在 YouTube 上呢看到一个让我非常感兴趣的一个一个访问。那么这个访问的主角呢是今天我们为你请来的主角，他的中文名字叫黄玉川，黄先生，他的英文名字叫做 Yu Kang Huang。在这个访问之中呢，讲的主要是他的一本新书。这本新书的我的中文的这个把它翻译过来了，叫叫他破解中国的谜团。他这是在经济上的谜团，有很多人说中国的经济走不下去。他在这次的这个访问之中谈到他为什么不赞成这种想法，而且自己有一些新的想法。那么当然非常明显的这个访问呢，就引起了我极大的兴趣，然后我就自告奋勇的发了一封 email 呢，给今天我们的来宾，啊、呃、黄先生呢，我希望能够请他在我们节目中呢和我们谈谈这本书的内容和他最新的一些想法。那么黄先生也非常爽快的答应了，我非常的高兴。那么，但是唯一的就是他说他的中文呢，对他来讲呢，在发表意见的时候可能不太灵光。他希望能够用英文来来接受这次访问。所以说，在今天节目中呢，我就为您请到了，呃，于康黄 ，Dr. 黄，黄宇川，黄先生。首先呢，我先把黄先生带到我们的画面之中，然后和黄先生打声招呼。Dr. 黄 ，Welcome。Thank you very much. Tell us about this book. You know, I went to Beijing in 1997 with the World Bank, and I was based there until about 2004 or 2005. And when I returned to Washington D.C.,、uh, a major policy think tank in Washington called the Carnegie Endowment asked me whether I would be willing to join them and write about China. And I found this quite interesting, and I spent about six months. Reading what the media, what the public, what policymakers were thinking about China, basically in Washington D.C. or in the United States and Europe, and to my surprise, I thought that what they focused on in terms of issues were quite different from the problems issues that I focused on when I was living in Beijing and working for the World Bank, and I was sort of like puzzled by this. Why is it that people in Washington think about China quite differently than people in Beijing, even among the diplomatic community? I'm an economist, and I focus on economic issues. And the more I read, the more I said there was something wrong in terms of how people look at China's economy, depending upon where they're located, and depending upon their training. And I started writing for the public media. So my first article. Were in newspapers like the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal. I eventually wrote for other、uh, media outlets, including Foreign Affairs,、uh, New York Times,、um, Bloomberg, and I basically focus on points where I feel that there's a difference of view, and often the commonly accepted view of an issue, of particularly an economic issue, was in my view wrong. And as an economist. I would basically focus upon this with empirical evidence or analytical reason.、It、cannot be just personal. And today, I've written something like 50 articles, twenty five for the Wall Street Journal, for example. And I decided actually to go into greater depth and publish a book so I could talk about these issues with more rigor and more detail. So that's the origins of my book, Cracking the China Conundrum, which was published by Oxford University Press. I chose a very establishment. Kind of a press because my views are actually quite radical. So I was <laughs> by having a very radical, established、uh, publisher. How, how many months ago was this book published? This book came out uh, in uh, July, August of last year.、Uh, it's not easily available in China.、Uh -huh. um, I'm now putting out a not yet. Edition. Not yet. It's hard to get in China.、Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's so many controls upon English language books. Particularly when they talk about China, so I'm actually coming out with a Chinese language version, probably toward the end of this year, being translated right now.、Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to add, or anything you would like to change、uh, with regards to the,、uh, the the content of this book since since it's it's been published? At the time that I was going to press, 
President Trump had just won the election. Mm -hmm. So I modified certain sections a little bit, talk a little bit about what this might mean for U.S.-China relations. And what I basically said at that time, this is about a year, year and a half ago, uh, was that Trump's election might lead to increased U.S.-China tensions as they pertain to trade and investment issues. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that is bearing itself out. I think that over the next couple of months, we're going to see a significant increase in tensions between the United States and China on economic issues, that America is very likely to levy sanctions, punitive sanctions, mm -hmm. which might lead to Chinese retaliation. So I think on the economic sphere, you're going to find increasing problems. And I mentioned that in the book. Mm -hmm. I also talked in the book about the issues in terms of a rising uh, great power, China, uh, which could be seen as a competitive threat to the United States. Right. And you've also seen this out in, in statements that the U.S. administration has put out. Uh, the security report recently labeled China as a competitive, as a, as, as a strategic competitor. And I think this is an accurate reflection of the situation. But a strategic competitor doesn't necessarily mean that relations will be unproductive. It's a question of how you deal with these issues. In terms of the economic points that are highlighted in my book on trade, the economy, on the question of whether China has a financial problem, on issues like corruption. Corruption is a serious issue in China, mm -hmm. being addressed seriously by the Chinese government. On each of these issues, what my book basically talks about is here's what the general public or even, even Chinese specialists think. And I point out that quite often, these views are wrong. And because these views are wrong, the policy recommendations, therefore, are wrong. And because the policy recommendations are wrong, you have increased tensions between China and America, to some extent more so than would normally be the case or should be the case. And I think this is a major problem. You know, uh, when I was reading your book and, and, and when I was uh, watching your video, uh, there's this one question keep coming to me. The question is, what makes this guy so special? Why makes him uh, understand or can see things where other people, other scholars cannot? How do you answer that question? Well, I have a somewhat of an unusual background, but not really for a Chinese American. I was born in China. Um, I came over here when I was very young. I have what I call some innate uh, uh, instincts in terms of what China is about mm. growing up in a Chinese family. Uh, but I was trained and educated in the West. So I very much understand the perceptions of the world, China from a Western perspective. Uh, when I got my PhD at Princeton, my thesis advisor was a Nobel Prize winner. And he said to me at the time, Yukon, you've been educated totally in the, in the United States. You need to understand a little bit more about perspectives from a, an Asian viewpoint or mm -hmm. an outside viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So he actually sent me to Malaysia uh, to write my PhD thesis. And afterwards, he basically sent me to Africa. Africa. He wanted, Africa. He wanted mm -hmm. me to understand different systems, the different problems. I went to Tanzania. Tanzania was a socialist economy at the time under Jewish Nyeri. It was quite different, quite different. Mm -hmm. Now, when I joined the World Bank and worked in many countries, including Burma, Malaysia, India, Philippines, my last assignment before I went to China was Russia. And Russia was a century planned economy, moving to a private economy in a much different way. So, so I have a perspective about economic issues which is quite varied. I also have what I call these Chinese origin roots. And the issue for me when I went to China was it's too easy to try to apply ideas that we picked up elsewhere and basically say this is appropriate for China. Right. Because in most cases, it is not. And that's one of the big issues in my book. There is no easy framework that one can just use to assess China. You have to basically integrate many different kinds of points and the outcome, the perspective that one should use for China, in my view, has to be uniquely constructed. And that's why I think many of the views in the West are actually uh, not, not correct. Mm -hmm. Said that, 
people would then say, well, does that mean that people in China, that their views are always correct or they have a better perspective? And as I point out in my book, that's not necessarily the case. There are many points in my book where I say the broad views of the Chinese, whether it's the public or the policymakers, may also be misguided. And I think this is what I'm trying to say in my book. It's a dangerous issue on both sides to grab or think simplistically about issues when they're so complicated. And I point out throughout the chapters of my book many examples of this kind of fallacy or mis misperception. Mm -hmm. On that note, could you give me a little bit more specific examples, like a three of each, from the Western to Chinese or Chinese to Western? How? Uh, what is the most common mistake they make from each side? Well, I, start off, I start off my book because I'm writing not just for what I call an academic audience. Certain, some chapters are fairly academic, uh -huh. but also for a, a much more broader audience. I start off with public perceptions about China and the United States. Mm -hmm. And I begin with a question. If you look at Gallup or Pew surveys of public opinion, of the United States, and you ask questions to the average American, and the question is, who is the world's leading economic power? Leading economic power. Oh, right. And 15 years ago, 60-70% uh, of the Americans would say America is. Only 10% would say China. Mm -hmm. Today, the majority of Americans say that China is the world's leading economic power. Now, if you ask the same question to China, to Chinese, the vast majority would say America was eating economic power. Mm -hmm. And the question begins, who's right and who's wrong? Now, in this particular question, very simply, the Chinese are correct. The U.S. is the world's leading economic power by any clearly analytical standard that you would uh, guess. Now, if you ask this question globally, to people in Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and Europe, everybody, every other region in the world would say that America is the world's leading economic power, except for one region. One other region in the world says that China is, and that region is Europe. Mm. So now you have a very strange situation. The U.S. and Europe believe that China is the world's leading economic power. But everybody else thinks America is. And I start off by saying, actually, the rest of the world is correct. But why is it the Europeans and Americans don't realize it? And it's because they have this worry about trade and trade influencing their perceptions of whether your country is doing well or not. And I point out, actually, that trade balances are not a good measure of a country's economic power. The rest of the world understands this, but Americans and Europeans do not. So that's one point I start off with. How come the average American, the average European, and even politicians, why do they get this wrong? And then they get into this question of, it's because they worry about deficit and surpluses, and they think that China, China has these huge trade surplus, America has huge trade deficit. The average American believes that America's trade deficit are being largely caused by China's trade surplus. So uh, la largely caused by what? I'm sorry. America's trade deficit are largely the result of China's large trade surplus. Okay, America okay. has huge trade deficit, overall trade deficit. And the view is that these deficits are the result of China having huge trade surplus. Right. America's trade deficit is $350 billion annually. Actually, $500 billion annually. And they have a bilateral trade deficit with China of around $350 billion, 60%. So their view is that my problem is China. China has a huge trade uh, surplus with me here in the United States. China is my, the problem. So I show later on, actually, that there's no relationship between America's trade balances and China's trade balance. America's been running trade deficits 40 years in a row way before China became an economic power. So how can China be causing America's trade problems when for much of this period, China was not even a major economic power? So I explain why. Let me give you another perception. You ask the average American, 
how much of America's foreign investment goes to China. And the general perception is that's very large. And because it's very large, there's a sense that jobs are being lost to China. Competitiveness of the Americas is being weakened by the process that too much American companies, too much of what American companies invest is going overseas to China. So in my chapter on investment, I ask the question, what percent of America's foreign investment goes to China? And the answer is less than 2%. Only less than 2% of America's foreign investment goes to China. So the question is now quite different. Instead of too much of America's investment going to China, the answer is, why so little? Mm -hmm. And I show little in, in contrast by comparing the United States with Europe. Europe invests a lot more in China than America. And the question is, why does Europeans invest a lot more in China, but Americans invest relatively little? So this is part of the issue of false perceptions. Uh, these are commonly held perceptions, but they're generally wrong, and you get the wrong false description. Right now, for example, the White House is very much focused upon trade, the bilateral trade practice. And they're likely to levy punitive duties or to penalize China uh, because of the excessive trade uh, surpluses they have in America. But as I show my book, this is not even the issue. It's actually a false characterization. Uh, Trump thinks that too, much, too many American companies are investing in China. The reality is actually the opposite. There's too little foreign investment going to China. I remember you were, t you were using an example of iPhone. Yes. Right? Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, the iPhone here, you, you see, all the iPhones are made, uh, assembled in, in China. So when you buy, the, let's say, the latest iPhone 10, it costs almost $1,000. Uh, it shows up in the balance of payment as a $1,000 deficit with China. Mm -hmm. But of that $1,000, how much of it actually goes to China? The answer is less than 4%. It's only $40 to $50 of that $1,000 iPhone actually goes to China's Chinese workers or owners. The rest, most of it, uh, four, $300, $400, goes to those who manufacture the parts and components, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan. And then the bulk of it actually goes, in the end, to Apple, in the form of profit. So here is something like a $1,000 export, but actually, what China gets out of it is only $40, $50. And you have many of these things. Many of these computers, uh, Hewitt Packard, Dell, these computers that people buy here in the U.S. that cost anywhere from about $300 to $1,000 or more. Question, who actually gets the most money from those computers? And a huge chunk of it goes essentially to Intel and Microsoft. Intel for the chips. Microsoft the software, only about 10 to 50% of that imported computer actually goes to China. So I basically explain in my book this perception that this trade problem is actually a problem in terms of China is a really false one. And I get into other kinds of issues that I think are, are quite important. Uh, uh, there's concerns about uh, foreign debt, uh, uh, financial crisis in China. And you see this in Wall Street or in London. China's debt indicators are surging. Um, people look at indicators about the property market surging in China. And the question is, is there a property market, a bubble? Is there a uh, financial crisis coming? Uh, this kind of discussion permeates the, the media, both internationally and as well as the United States. And I basically show that this is actually a, mis mis a misapprehension is not actually correct. So what is surprising to me here is there's so much attention focused on China, and so much of it is oriented toward financial economic issues, but much of it, in my view, is actually wrong. And when it is wrong, then the policy prescriptions people are basically proposing are likely to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And in my view, this is part of the reason why the U.S.-China tensions are worse than they need because people don't really understand the issue correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what kind of reaction you are receiving since the book been published? Well, feelings on China are very strong. 
there are those who are, they, there are many people who are skeptical about China. Uh-huh. There are many people who are apprehensive of what's happening in China. Mm-hmm. There are, of course, others who basically realize that China's rise has been a positive force for the world, positive force for consumers everywhere. Uh, certainly a positive force for China, some 500 million people. Mm-hmm. Uh, been uplifted from poverty, and that's certainly a very good thing. But whenever you have a, a, a rising power who is, in the minds of many Americans, a potential threat to his position in the world, right. then you have apprehension and tensions, and, and I think this is an, a big issue. So you have these kinds of negative and positive views. Skeptic. Uh, there are people who basically say uh, the best economic model is always grounded on capitalism, free markets. Uh, difficult for them to accept the fact that here is a socialist market economy, some kind of a mixed economy that has been growing incredibly well for three or four decades. Uh, in some ways, it's hard for people to accept that. And therefore, they either come up with arguments saying, well, their, their numbers are misstated, they're not accurate, or it's going to collapse very soon, it's not really sustainable, because it's actually very hard to accept the fact that there could be an alternative. I try to point out that this world is actually not black and white. There are many shades of market-driven economies, some more state-involved, uh, some more pure. Uh, I have one chapter in the book where I try to compare the problems that America faces and the problems that China faces. Mm-hmm. And I actually see that many of these problems they face are very similar, actually. Uh, they have similar objectives, similar goals, similar issues. The issue is how do you address it? And, and for example, uh, there is significant income inequality in the United States. There is significant income inequality in China. Economists have a measurement of inequality. Mm-hmm. It's called the Gini coefficient. I'm sorry? And it's the Gini coefficient, uh-huh. G-I-N-I. And the Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality. A coefficient of one means that one person owns everything. A coefficient of zero means that income is perfectly equal, okay? So uh, Scandinavian countries or socialist countries in Europe, more socialist countries in Europe, they have a more equal society. Their Gini coefficients are somewhere around 0.30 to 0.40, okay? Latin American countries have high inequality. Uh, Their indices are more like 0.6. Now, ironically... So is the ideal number 0.5? Uh, I would say an ideal number, realistically speaking, might be something like 0.4. 0.4, okay. okay. That would be probably a very good number. Mm-hmm. But here is the interesting observation. The Gini coefficient for America and China is exactly the same. Oh, my God. Okay. By 0.48. 0.48. Okay. 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 Now, here's interesting. Complete different economic system. But the degree of inequality is exactly the same. Okay. Now, we all recognize inequality is a problem and you need to deal with it. So I basically say they actually have the same problem. They have a degree of inequality, which in some ways could be improved. And how you deal with it is a big issue for both countries. Right. So I, that's an issue. Now, I also point out, for example, that both countries have a problem with size in terms of size of company. Uh, during the global financial crisis, the problem in the United States was that its banks were too big to fail. Banks are too big to fail. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. America's problem. Mm -hmm. Banks and and certain financial entities are too big. You have the Chase Manhattan's, Bank of America's, insurance companies. Uh, There are fewer and fewer of them. They've gotten bigger and bigger. And there are risks, because they're so big you can't let them fail. Even the American auto company became so big that when General Motors got into trouble, America could not allow General Motors to fail. So America has a problem. Many of its major companies are too big to fail. Now, China has a similar kind of problem in a different way. Its state enterprises are so big, they're too big to manage. It's not a question of failure because the state owns them. Mm -hmm. The problem is, how do you manage entities which are so large? And China, I think, has a problem. Its largest state enterprises are not very efficient because they're too big to manage. So both have a problem of size, okay? Now, you look at regulation. China, the U.S. has a problem in terms of regulatory regime. Um, It's finding it very difficult to deal with public utilities, uh, communications companies. 
ter- terms of sorting out how to regulate. So regulating private companies in the United States is an issue. Uh, regulation is also an issue in China. Uh, there, there are uh, railways, there are uh, consumer products, lots of risks, very difficult. So both countries have problems in terms of regulation. Innovation is, a, is an issue in both countries. The United States is a very innovative country. But because it's so innovative, there are also high risks in the economy. Um, China is trying to become very innovative. By many measurements, it's very, very successful. But China wastes a lot of money in the process of trying to become innovative. So their objectives are quite similar in many areas. And they could learn a lot from each other in terms of how do you deal with these kinds of issues? And then how do you deal with these issues given there were particular institutions and the economic structures of these two economies? And there hasn't been enough of that kind of sharing because much of the tension that exists today is much more of it uh, driven by a sense of uh, either you win or I win. Or, and no, no such thing as we could both win if we could actually both share and collaborate. So my book, I talk a little bit more about this, that this kind of a, a win-lose kind of mentality has been, has been dominating the discussions over the years rather than a win-win mentality. If I make a statement that the Chinese has a tendency to look for more of a win-win solution as opposed to a Western uh, culture has a tendency to look for, not to look for, to get a win-lose uh, a scenario. Would that statement be correct to you? I, I, you're right in the sense that Chinese leadership tends to put forward a strategy or a position of saying we should focus more on win-win proposition, more collaborative proceedings. Uh, whereas what's been happening in recent years, particularly from a U.S. Perspective, uh, is a sense that uh, if that is a sense that the United States is that we're losing, we're losing from the global financial system, we're losing from free trade and globalization, uh, the benefits of all accrue to China. Uh, they become the largest exporting country in the world. Right. They've amassed uh, one point four trillion dollars of reserve. Uh, there are uh, they've been gaining in terms of employment and, and incomes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a sense in America is that the rules of the game somehow um, have led to China winning, winning, and that at the expense of America. So I begin with the point that I made earlier about perception, who is the world's leading economic power? Americans think China is, because they think China's been benefiting a lot. So you have a, a real irony here, because if you ask, how did this happen? It began in 1980 when Deng Xiaoping opened up China. Mm-hmm. And everyone welcomed China into the global economy. Everyone welcomed China into the United States system, into its membership in WTO. Remember, this system, this global system, was largely created by the Western powers, particularly America. So the great irony is the West, America, welcomes China into the global economic, uh, administrative, financial system. China does extremely well. As part of that system, a system largely created by the West, but the irony today is the West now says, China, you've been doing too well. we are not getting enough benefit from having you in the system. Uh, where are these benefits? And I think this is a, a legitimate question for discussion. What is it that China could do to strengthen the perception in the West that there are opportunities, there are equal opportunities in having China as part of the system, and uh, these opportunities should be realized. In my book, I, I focus a lot upon uh, foreign investment, uh, that there is great potential for more foreign investment to be going into China in particular areas. Mm-hmm. Remember the, the point that I made earlier, how much of America's foreign investment actually goes to China? And the answer is, Less than two percent. 